Okay, uh, today we have a special seminar that uh, gives you a little background about the history uh, of science at FIU. You see these buildings here. There was once only two buildings um, and the an airstrip uh, and so on. And Florentine will tell you about that. And then, uh, so Florentine, by the way, Dr. Morass, uh, he was here at, in the second year that FIU was a university. That's 1973. FIU started in 1972. So he's now here in his 50th year. <laughs> 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 <As a professor>. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll hear from Dr. Heinen, who came in at the very beginning of the Environmental Studies program, uh, which started in 1990. Well, the program started much earlier. We'll talk about that. The department started in 1990. Well, three, four. So, I've, so it's 30 years from now. Okay, so he's been here. He's older than I am. <laughs> okay, and I'm just going to listen and learn. So, uh, Florentine, take it. You have 20, 25 minutes. We'll put you all on. A long story. Okay. Anyway, good afternoon. So welcome, and I'm glad that you could come, and I'm also glad that I could be alive to tell you this story. Ultimately, <laughs> <laughs> too many of my colleagues are already gone. So as you can see here, I'm making this a little bit funny so that you can understand, you know, the uh, what, where FIU came from. So that's why I see the birth of a university, you see the light and all of those things that are coming out of it. The next thing, of course, this is the impact. I looked at this because I am one of the impact guys. So I see it as an impact on Florida, not only just Florida, on the whole United States. It's going to have a tremendous effect on us. So, then we start, this is what it looked like in 1969, just completely empty. Okay, of course I wasn't there, I got to go those things from the, from the library. So that was an airport, as you can see here, 1971, that's when they have the gun breaking. And you see all of this is just completely empty. This is, this was an airport. So, the groundbreaking for FIU was extraordinary because they call it FIU, Florida International University. And as you can see, Florida International University, oh, let us forget. they invited the, Secretary, the United Nations Secretary, that's Utah that you see here because of the international in name. That's probably the only international university that we know in the United States and even in the world. So this is what it looked like. But at that time, that's 1972. 1972, the building you see here is PC, Premier Casa, that we call now uh, Charles Perry Building. You see this airport, I have seen this, you know, when I came here in 1973. So here you see PC and then DM. When I arrived here, we had PC and DM. That's all. And then as you can see, everything else was completely empty. So, hallelujah, I see. The child is born, 1972. 1972, this is what's going to put you here, okay? That was a big deal. But notice that here you see grass. This is grass in front of PC, okay? This is not the, the uh, concrete that you, that you know. The most important thing really when I arrived here that attracted me are the goals of the university because I graduated you know, from a big university and I ran it here. And I, of course, when I read the advertisement, they say university, they didn't see what it was until I arrived here. <laughs> Of course, when I arrived, first of all, the first site I had, 107 
was being asphalted. 107 did not exist as a big avenue when I arrived. And then I got in here, two buildings, okay? But in the front of Primera Casa, you had the goal of the university. And I think this is fantastic. The person who wrote the goal. And what attracted me is the greater international understanding. Because I wanted to come to FIU, to this university that is closest to the Caribbean so that I can help the Caribbean people because this is where I come from. So this is why I arrived. Then I say, okay, very little, but we can make it. <clears throat> So 1973, 1973, when I arrived, we had the Department of Physical Science, as you see here, chemistry, physics, geology. The people you see with this red dot, red dot, <clears throat> star, those were the original people over here. So that means in 1972, the university opened with only five people in the physical science. Those five people are going now to go into chemistry, physics, geology later on, and environmental. So you see, and then that's when we arrived, you see, in 1973. We had four more, one more, two more chemists, and two geologists, George Shaw. But what happened is, in my interview, they promised all kinds of things, like usually they do an interview. <laughs> and then I arrived. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Just visualize yourself. You come to a university to teach, you have absolutely nothing to teach. Yeah. Fortunately, I brought some, I don't know, I had the feeling I brought a lot of material that I had that I collected when I was in college student in France and Colombia, everywhere. I had those materials. Those are the ones that I used. So we started it. The first year, we had, we had two geologists, Josh Shaw, who is an American guy, he said, no way, I am not staying, and he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so 1972, that's the first catalog of the university. As you can see here, the Division of Natural Sciences, they have mathematics and so on and so on, but environmental doesn't show them even though environmental studies is going to be there because the chair, which was Ruth Weiner, wanted environment. And of course, Jack was a very, very, very strong opponent of environment and art area as well, even though this is not listed. That's what I wanted to show you. So the first catalog, it's not listed as, if, as an official part of the university, but it was there. So this is what you have, the environmental study program. But since the very beginning, what's going to happen as you are going to see is that Jack concept was to have an environmental program that includes all the, all the departments of the university. Whereas the physicists, the chemists and myself, we came to build distinct programs. And sometimes this is what, when the conflict came, even though we were, go we were going to develop little by little in different departments. So 1974, of course, 1975, as you can see, more buildings. So we start to grow. And I started to, to be very involved as well since 1974, as I, I'm going to show you here. 1974, believe it or not, I got the first grant that FIU ever got. So I opened the door of its NSF for FIU, the first grant ever. So at the same time, because international, I tried with the dean to have cooperative program with Haiti to help Haiti. And this is how we got six Haitians to came one after the other that would train here to get the bachelor's degree. And at the very end, 2001, another one really got his master's. So this is the international part that I wanted to put pursue here. <laughs> then <clears throat> 1974, 1976, as you will see, I don't know whether you can, you can read it, 
you see that that's the first time that the president appears in the Kagawa with his message. But at the same time, environmental studies is there. You can see that this, the concept is still to have different faculty from different departments, not a, an environmental department as such. And this is going to continue for a long time. Whereas in 1974, 1976, geology already occurs on itself. <laughs> See, we have our own program here. So the geology majors, because again, I came here to build a geology program. <clears throat> so very active everywhere, as you're going to see, because you know we we're young, very active, very ambitious. So I got a grant from the from the FIU Foundation. We had, as I told you, we had nothing. So those are the first thing. One is still, both of them are still in our labs, as a matter of fact. And this one, I got the display, and this display should should be used to be in PC where you see the presidents today. That's where it used to be. Yeah, because that was international, and then we had this display of the Caribbean. We have very beautiful display. So that's, that was somehow to show things at that time. Okay. So, and then this big rock cutter that I, I bought. Not only that, at the same time, I was involved with Dan Jackson, who was in, in technology because there was no engineering school here. It was environmental, it was technology, the school of technology. But he was very interested in environment, pushing for the drinking water center. And together with him, we visited uh, mall industry. Mall industry, why mall industry is because mall industry was mining and still now, as a matter of fact, now it's all, uh, I forgot what the name is, but mall industry belonged to the former mayor of Miami. And because of the quarry, they wanted to close it. And I did that work together with Dan Jackson. And this is the publication that we have here about it to show them that's not true, that removing the rock is not going to affect the, the aquifer. Actually, it's even better for it because you have more water actually instead of rocks. So that's how we got involved everywhere. But the most important part for FIU is when we got involved in real politics. There was Richard Stone. Richard Stone, as I showed here, he was first the Secretary of State here, and then he became a senator. Just the year he was elected to the Senate, he was very approachable. And of course, Ben Jackson was a really a mover, really. And we got an interview with him to present the case for the drinking water center to receive direct funding from Tallahassee because he had all those connections in Tallahassee. This is what happened in 1977. In 1977, until now, I'm going to tell you what happened. Until now, they received funding directly from Tallahassee, that means from the board. This was quite interesting because the drinking water center was designed in such a way that we will have the environmental people from technology and we will have the people from the physical sciences. There will be lines attached to the, to the center, but those lines will be in such a way that half of them will be in the center and half of them will be in the department. Why? Because the young people we were, we were going to hire, they will have an opportunity to stay in the center, to do research and publish, and then they go back to our department full time. So another faculty will benefit from it. This is the way it was supposed to be. <clears throat> but through time, what happened, of course, there will be some problem with the environmental, between the environmental technology, because we were competing. This is one of the big things that they value at that time. Everybody was competing for money. Everybody was competing for FTEs. FTEs is full-time equivalent yeah. students because you get lines based on the FTEs. That means how many students you are serving. It was very competitive. 
even between ourselves. So that's what we did. So the drinking water center turned later on into the South Florida uh, surf, so the Southeast uh, Regional Center. And they split it. So part of it went to engineering and part of it stayed here. And this center now evolved into now what is the institute. But the funding of that institute came from the drinking water center that Dan Jackson and myself, we really lobbied for. <clears throat> now, of course, FIU is developing. We have Bay Vista. Bay Vista is a North Campus. North Campus is developing because uh, Gordon, who was one of the representatives of Florida, was from the North Miami, and he wanted to have a university up there. This is why they opened the Bay Vista. And environmental strategy, as you could see here very clearly, look at all the names. All of those people, international relations, economics, anthropology, and biology, physical science, Ken Hardy, which is a physicist, and Hutchinson, Morris, physical science. We were, that was the physic, that was the environmental studies. Again, as I mentioned to you, this is that a composite of department, not a really particular department. Why I'm saying this, because later on you'll see that when the university was claiming money to build buildings and labs for those, for those departments, environmental studies was not there. And this is why they did not have lab, because there was no real department. This was the a composite department from different disciplines. So as you can see here, where I was part of environment, so everybody basically. So 1979, 1980, but that's the first time that they listed all the board, the, the university president and everybody else. At the same time, I wanted to show environmental studies. Again, it's the same thing. Environmental studies is just a composite of all, all kinds of faculty from the university. While geology was already building up. And the master's program, I don't know whether you can read it. The master's program is in, in technology, not really in here. We did not, they did not have the master's program here. The real big impact that's going to make FIU becoming the FIU that you know today, is this time, 1980. 1980, as you can see here, is the first class freshman. That the first class, first class. That was a big deal. Why? Because not only we have now lower division, because FIU started as an upper division classes that you probably read in, in the books. Then the first time that FIU now becomes a four year full full-time students, then we have those freshman classes. That's when FIU really started to go, which benefited us. Why? Because now we have to teach more students. Therefore, we have to have more labs. If we need more labs, then we need more TAs. This is the way it was. The more students you serve, the more TAs you need. So we can make our case to the dean the dean will make it to the provost, to the president, and the president to the board of regents, so they get money this way. So this is why we were all pushing to have as many T as many TAs as we can, because this those TAs will allow us to do our research. So those class first class freshman is the one that started the university this way. So here I am showing you the drinking water center. Because for some reason, even though the, the drinking water center was officially fully funded in 1977, but it appeared in the catalog only in 1982-93 catalog. But is, here is to show you again, environmental studies, as you can see those names, all of those people, biological science, physical science, psychology, anthropology, and then this is the way it was. But it's some kind of a mistake because all the fundings to get faculty is going to derive from 
a discipline and that discipline building of the FTEs, even though they are building of FTEs, but they were not really focusing on a particular discipline to claim because as later on, all those labs are going to be built for the different disciplines. <clears throat> so again, to show you earth sciences, we are building up as different disciplines with specific faculty, chemistry, you see here the same thing, but not the environment. So that was the problem. <clears throat> you see, uh, well, we're only two this, at this time, 1982, of course, as Graham Draper, because as I mentioned to you, the former, the former colleague just gave up the first year. So Draper came in 1978. I, I'm making a long story short because we had another faculty in between, which we fired. <laughs> That's it. I heard the story. Yeah. So FIU is growing big. Okay. Then what happened? The real person, because I forgot to mention that Harry, as you probably saw from the from the from the slide, Harry left. Then we have Wolf. Wolf really is the person who really put FIU on the feet as real university children. Because it was a real statement and a real scholar and very approachable and he understood the things. So this is why he promised to give us the first class freshman and he gave it the next year. And he put the university, all those programs and so on. And he, he resigned. Then. After he resigned, then we have Medic. Medic, he came, that's the big bloom. That means he came on that momentum that we had because everybody was building up and so on. So Medic, I, I put this picture here because I couldn't find a different picture. That's the opening of the 8th Street entrance that these beautiful things, the arcades that you see, you see him very young here at that time, we were all there then. <laughs> so again, environmental studies, just to show you. That's 1992, 1993. Those were critical years because those were the years when the university was claiming money to build the buildings and the labs. So because this was not a real department, that's why they were out. Okay, that was the, the, the problem. And you can see, look at the, all the names. Again, people from everywhere. <clears throat> Graduate catalog. You see, look at that. By the 1992, 1993, look at all the geologists who were building up. Those are real geologists, that means individual faculty that you see here, who were building up as a, a different department. Of course, physics, the same thing. Chemistry, the same thing as completely different department, whereas environment still had people from everywhere else. And that's when we got the building for chemistry and physics, and the big building that you see here. That's when they built the, the lab for geology because the way it was, you built enough FTEs, you have those FTEs give you the faculty, and the Board of Regents knows that the faculty have to have labs. You see, if they hire a faculty, you have to have labs. And those labs also are serving the graduate students. The graduate students also have to have labs. So this is why those spaces were designed very specifically for those programs. And those programs, they were the ones to tell them how to build those things. And we had consultant coming from outside. You see, this was not just like that. So those consultants will be in agreement with us. This is what we want, this lab with this particular type of thing and so on and so on. So this is how we got those labs. They were designed for specific programs and those programs were going to develop to give you see graduate programs with faculty MS and, and PhDs. So that's 1992-1993. College of Art and Science. Again, if you see here in the college, at that time we had Arthur Ariot as, as the dean. But if you look at 
liberal studies, Janet Parker, of course, which is Jack Parker, environmental study, they listed it, but it's still not a really definite program which is going to develop in the next year, but it was already delayed because all those programs already had their labs and the buildings. So this is what happened. 1994, 1995. You see, again, if you look at this, you see those the different programs, environmental studies, you see John Parker, Jack Parker was still out of it, but he did not have a specific location because he was out of it when those buildings were being claimed. <clears throat> Whereas if you look at geology, we're already a program. So we in, in, in DC, and of course, physics and chemistry, they have this big building. So this is what happened, 1994, 1995, of course, we were already way out there, because in order to develop, because I'm doing, trying to be, go very fast, but in order to get those graduate programs, it was not that simple. It's not that you see you want a graduate program. We had to go to so many steps. We had to have an external, person coming to evaluate the program. And the first evaluation that we had in 1987 from a professor from Yale, he was so happy with the program. That's when he said we had to have a master's program immediately because we had good faculty. They had really, they were doing good research and they had grants and so on. So that's how we got the master's program. The same thing when we get to the PhD program because by 1992, 1994, we already had to be, again, we had to have another evaluation. And the evaluators, they said, yes, we can have a PhD because we were well equipped. We had the appropriate labs. Therefore, we could have a PhD because they would not allow you to have a PhD program if you did not have the proper faculty or if you, have, if you did not have the proper lab facilities for those people. So this is what happened. So 1994, again, geology were really way out there. You can see that little sign because, of course, by 1994, we did hire Dean at that time. But because the catalog is a little bit later ahead, that's why. But you will appear in the next one, Dean. <laughs> so here, you can see Dean Whitman. So again, the department was already built up at that time. We had all the faculty. Of course, Dean Whitman replaced another faculty who left because we had quite a few faculty came in and out. It was a job market, you know, we tell them so. And by that time, we already had a PhD, okay? So, but then Joel will tell you, and as you see here now, the doctor of philosophy. So we were already well-established. We had our labs and so on. And to make a long story short, then 2003, here you see that's basically all the people that we, that you know you will notice, of course, if most of them we lost that they have not replaced because usually the way it was, the department will have specific lines assigned to them that you earn with, based on your FTEs. And then when a, when a faculty left, because some of those faculties, they find better, better jobs somewhere else, they, they will immediately replace them, which they are not doing now. This is why we are completely depleted. <clears throat> and you see Osbury Hickey, then we have Brad Clement who left, Greenville Draper is one of the last one left. And uh, what you see here, that's because Mike, Mike Sukup would come a little bit later. So this is later on that Mike Sukup. I think Mike, you come in 1999, 2000, isn't it? Yeah. Huh? 2003. 2003. So then just about, that's why you're not in the catalog because you're not in those catalogs, you know, they printed a little bit before. So this is the story here. Then, of course, that's 2003, again, environmental studies that finally, right, I can see environmental studies listed with those people, but those are the real faculty that they have. So that's when they started to build up, and of course you will see. But as I said, that all the buildings were already done, all the labs, so this is why you see you're scattered all over the place. You see, that's the problem. You know? We've always been all over. <laughs> no, but this is one of the things I didn't want. Okay, to make it long story short. When they were going to build the physics and chemistry building, theology was supposed to be part of it. And of course, 
again, I don't want to say something bad, but there was somebody who did not quite like us, okay, geology. And they say, oh no, we have those labs in PC, we'll have some labs in PC and some lab in the new building. I said, no way. We have to be all together. We see everywhere that I have been, department, that's the better way they function when all faculty and their labs are all together. And this is when I proposed to make it. You know, I went again, this is what some people don't want to do now, is just to go and make a proposal to him. I showed him that we had classrooms in PC. And I told him we can use those classrooms to, to build new labs, but those will be dry labs because we already had the facilities for the wet labs there. And then you can renovate this thing and we'll all be together. This is why geology was together. And then physics and chemistry together. So I said, no, we cannot do it. Fortunately, made it accepted by the proposal. Okay. So this is what happened. So now, of course, uh, that's the bad story. Then, of course, 2015, those are the latest ones. The ones that were left, 2015. <laughs> and you're going to see that. I believe it or not, this one is gone. This one is gone. And I say gone to the great queries. 2022, those are the last ones. I don't know how many of us will be the next year. The <laughs> questions for him, or how do you want to do this? Do I just go save questions for the end, or yeah, <clears throat> oh, there you are. <laughs> I didn't recognize you with your mask on. <laughs> We're having a little problem with the Zoom, but let's have to go. Well, <clears throat> I'm much less tech savvy than my senior colleague. I didn't prepare a PowerPoint. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to tell you very quickly about environmental studies that are going to start from 30 years ago. So he's already kind of doing the backdrop. Of that. Yeah. Got it? Okay. So as Dr. Morris said, um, you know, uh, really what was physical sciences here at FIU eventually um, evolved into four separate departments. And um, by the time uh, I got here, environmental studies was a very, very active undergraduate program directed by Jack Parker, who was the founder of the program and the founder eventually of the department. Jack is still alive and well. I just heard from him a few weeks ago. Uh, we were going to try and coerce him to fly down here for this. He, they're living in North Carolina now, but he said he wasn't really up to doing that. So he said, you can handle it. You were here for enough minutes. Thank you. So um, so uh, the, the, the university, of course, was really taking off and growing very, very fast. And the original science departments were, as he mentioned, getting established quite well. But I think that... Um, <clears throat> It was apparent to me by the time I got here that environmental studies, partly because it was interdisciplinary, we not only had uh, the BS degree, which included a lot of science requirements, but some social science requirements, which it still does. We also had a BA degree that was mostly a uh, social science and humanities degree. Our um, sustainability degree has taken over from that, so the BA no longer exists. But um, uh, and, and because of that, that's why it was so interdisciplinary. So I guess you could say it was really kind of the bastard stepchild of the physical sciences. And um, <clears throat> then in the early 90s, they decided we were in fact going to have a separate department of environmental studies, the course physics, chemistry, and earth sciences. I'm not sure, I think it was called geology back then, I'm not sure, yeah. uh, had already really taken off. And as he mentioned, he was one of the first recipients of a National Science Foundation grant, but by the early 90s, there were a lot more people getting a lot more money. The center, the drinking water center had already fully formed, was bringing lots of grant money. CERC, the Southeast Environmental Research Center, also was formed and formulated in the early 90s. And in fact, that's when Dr. Ross started. I think, I believe it was around the same time as me, right? 1993 as a full-time uh, research scientist with CERC. 
and several other people. So there was lots of money uh, coming in. The sciences were really building and environmental studies was still the bastard stepchild. So um, <clears throat> I applied for this job. It would have been in winter of uh, 1993. I uh, was had just finished my PhD at Michigan in the fall of 1992. And uh, I got two job offers. One was here and the other was Michigan Technical University in the Houghton Peninsula, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And of course I was living in Ann Arbor, so it was Michigan. But um, if you ever fly to uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in the month of March, you might realize why I accepted this job. <laughs> <laughs> but Michigan Tech is quite a good school. It's just a very small school. And you know, the nearest airport is like, uh, I don't know, Duluth, Minnesota or so. It's, it's a really remote area in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I love going there, but I didn't really want to live there. And also I saw this as a challenge because at that time and already for several years, probably even more than a decade, and for well over a decade after that, FIU is the fastest growing university in the country, and they were adding programs like crazy. They were building buildings like crazy. And I thought, huh, I'm up to this challenge. So I was hired. My first contract was, believe it or not, with the Department of Chemistry, because they have to put a faculty member in a department, and there was no department. And I was up at Michigan's biological station teaching a course during the uh, spring term up there. Um, and I got this uh, contract by fax saying, oh, you're an assistant professor of chemistry. And I immediately called up the dean's office and said, I only got B minuses and C in every chemistry course. I, I can't be, this is awful. And they said, no, no don't worry. We, we don't have a department yet, but it, it will be for me. So I came down and met all the people. And of course, Jack Parker was the one who hired me. But we also at that time, had other people who were half-time, Brad Bennett and David Lee and Tom Plisk, all from biology. So it was uh, three half-time biologists who had formal uh, appointments now as of that year, environmental studies, Jack Parker, who was still half-time with chemistry, and then myself. So I was the first full-time hire for environmental studies. So I immediately started planning and doing this and that. So it was really just five guys. And then we started hiring other people. So the very next year, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Bott joined, and um, we've been uh, side by side ever since. A few years later, we hired uh, Dr. Jay Chundran. At that time, as um, Dr. Ross was mentioning, we had no space. And so, and Dr. Lee took over as our department chair at first. So we took him from biology for a while, and he was just fighting, fighting, fighting for space. Finally, we realized if we were gonna hire scientists, we couldn't really do it without being assigned lab space because that's just not gonna work. So several of those hires, including Dr. Jai Chandra's originally was half time with the Southeast Environmental Research Center because as a center, they had lab space. And so we kind of um, uh, pieced together things like that. And uh, we made several more hires in the um, 1990s that proved very effective, including Dr. Michael McLean, who um, left after quite a while, but he founded a few important things here. So, uh, and we were building and we were tweaking our degrees and we were getting bigger and bigger. And we still had this problem of, we had way more FTEs by this point than earth sciences or even physics, but we didn't have the lab space. We couldn't build the science. We couldn't build the research like they had already been, been doing. So the talk of a merger first started way, way back then um, with uh, when um, Mitch Batik was president, and he kind of mentioned, couldn't you merge uh, Earth Science, which was doing very well scientifically, but didn't have a lot of students, and environmental studies, and we already had some overlap in areas as we were developing things like hydrology and GIS and things like that. But this was before any of us, I think, were willing to even merge. So we were still in this kind of uh, departmental situation. I also developed the master's program as an assistant professor, which is not heard of anywhere else. Um, and by 1996, we implemented the Master of Science in Environmental Studies. I uh, directed that program for three years. It was very small at first. Um, 
And then Dr. Bott took that over and it grew quite a bit during the months, especially under his directorship. Our program was just going gangbusters. Then um, <clears throat> Dr. Lee stepped down from being department chair in 96 and we hired David Brayan, who most of you don't even know because he just retired fairly recently. He uh, ably led the department for five years. We made some more hires and things like that, but we still had this enormous problem with space because the university was growing all over the place simultaneously. It was so bad at one point um, that uh, you know, there were people in the social sciences, for example, faculty, tenured faculty, who had to share offices. I mean, it was that bad as we were growing that fast. So it was hard to talk to all of our affiliated faculty. And as he mentioned, we had them all over the university in anthropology and sociology and psychology and things like that. When they didn't even have their own office, them complaining about, oh, you know, we need X hundred square foot lab, you know, lab space. And they're like, I don't even have an office to myself. So, um, so this is how the, the situation was. So we got quite ahead of ourselves, I think, FIU uh, uh, as an institution in terms of hiring faculty compared to space. And it was really dire situations for much of the 1990s. As we moved into the knots, things um, opened up a little bit and things got a little bit better. And uh, then David Bray stepped down from being chair after five years, I think it was. And so in uh, 2002, I took over as chair. We uh, also lost several people. One of our people was denied tenure back then. Happened to have been our first female faculty member, which kind of made us look not so good, but it was not our decision. It was well above our heads that that happened. And then um, the halftime people, Dr. Lee and Dr. Bennett went back to full-time biology. So we lost those hires. We had another young faculty member who was hired at the same time as Bonnet was, who took another job elsewhere. So by the time I took over as chair of environmental studies, we had been a department of 12 and we we're now a department of eight. And so the first thing I told the Dean, and it was, a, it was a big time of transition anyway, under the the six years I was chair, I worked under four different deans. So it was, one of them to, was just interim. So it was a big time of transition anyway, but Art Harriet was still the Dean when I first took over. And I said, look, do you wanna have a department or don't you? And if you wanna have a department, I need at least three and probably four new hires just this year. And so they approved three and then they approved the fourth. And so we were able to hire, four people in one year. Unfortunately, three of those people eventually went elsewhere. The fourth one was Dr. Kerji Zhang, who some of the older people in this room knew very well. He passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, but he was a very active faculty member for many, many years. And so um, a few years later, we were able to hire a Dr. Melissa and a few other people. And then by the time I was stepping down as chair in the 2007-8 academic year, we were able to make five new hires. That includes uh, many of the ones people you know now, Dr. Um, <clears throat> React is a teaching professor, Dr. Cool is a teaching professor. Also um, Jennifer Shop and or Jennifer Rehaus, excuse me, I'm using her maiden name. Uh, and uh, Hong Lu, uh, two ecologists. And so we're able to, um, and also Dr. Sinto, he was already a research scientist. So we were able to get a half line for him in the department. And of course he's now our uh, department chair. So with that, I thought, good, we're now strong. The biggest worry, because we'd already been talking about merging for several years, and the biggest worry was, crap, geology is bigger than us, and anything we propose, they'll be able to outvote. See, this is the kind of Machiavellian thinking that people have, <laughs> particularly the older faculty, for the reason she mentioned. We we're competing against each other for space and lines and things like this. And so I thought, okay, good. Now we're about the same size. They can't outvote anything we try to do so. And uh, I was actually in favor of the merger for several years before anyway. Dr. Hickey Barnes was actually the chair at the time when I talked to her about this. They said, I'm sorry, but we came up with a full vote and we had one particular recalcitrant faculty member who happened to be the most senior person, <laughs> Jack Parker, and he's like, no, we should not merge with our sciences. And then we didn't get the vote. So eventually we did, and there were a few stumbles along the way, but I think we, we ended up both, all the programs I think ended up stronger as a result. But I wanna step back and tell you about a few other things that happened during the knots. Of course, um, 
Just prior to that, at the, the turn of the millennium, FIU became a research one university. So we were on the big ranks and no longer on the sort of regional ranks. We we're already quite big um, by those kinds of standards, but it wasn't until 1999, 2000, I think was the official school year that we had enough grant money and enough PhD programs and yada yada to be on the, the big list. Of course, there, you know, uh, a bunch of uh, your faculties alma maters at the top of that list, and we're no longer, we're no, nowhere near at the top, but um, we're, we're coming up quite well, and some of our programs are very well recognized now. So that only started, and that created new possibilities, because within the State University System of Florida, there's only five research, one universities of all the other, and of course, Miami was two, but, um, you know, that's not very much in a state this big. I mean, I don't know how many California has, but it's probably about, you know, 12 or 15, something like that. Um, and New York even has more uh, when you count the private schools too, which is a smaller state now. So, so that puts us in a different situation, but we've never been in the situation budgetarily from the state as the University of Florida is or some of the others. So that's, you know, we've always had that constraint as well. The other thing I wanna mention very briefly is how successful we were. And it's just, uh, correlational that I was chair. <laughs> I, I didn't do a lot of this stuff. I, we just really sort of took off. So at one point, for example, Drs. Botten, Jai Chandran, and Melissa came, we started talking about, they had these ideas for developing an agroecology program. Some of you are the beneficiaries of that. They started getting a lot of money from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Eventually, they petitioned and were able to get us um, Hispanic land grant status, uh, which means more federal types of um, grants and student assistance is available to us than other schools. Uh, so those those guys worked very, very hard on that. And of course, it's been an award-winning program. It's brought a huge amount of money, mostly for student support. So it supported a lot of student research too, but really a lot of that money goes to student support. It's not, you know, um, esoteric, you know, theoretical research. It's applied research and student support. And also around that time, Dr. Michael McLean, who's no longer with us, um, started the GLOWS project, and that's the Global Rivers uh, project. And um, in fact, at that time, we hired Beth Anderson, who's now a faculty member in our department. She was a scientific advisor to GLOWS right out of her PhD at Georgia. And she's, of course, stayed out with us. Now she's faculty here. But the GLOWS project also brought in millions of dollars. So all of a sudden, the, <clears throat> the bastard stepchild was being a big generator of lots of external money, too, which kind of counts for a lot. So with all that and with what was happening and the successes that Earth Science was already having, that's when we decided, OK, now we can start talking about a, a merger. We, we in environmental studies were also denied several times developing our own PhD program, in spite of having a very, very well enrolled master's program. And the, they just didn't like the idea of new PhD programs, but tweaking old PhD programs was uh, a possibility. So that became a possibility because Earth Sciences already had its PhD program. So when we merged, uh, we were still kind of here and there and all over the place. So we still have labs in a bunch of different buildings. Uh, it, certainly, we, we never had the, the single unified department that we would have liked to. It's gotten a little bit better that way with most of us now in AHC5, but that building's only been there for, what, 10 years or less. I can't even remember when we moved there. So um, so it's still not ideal, but uh, I think what it, the synergism has allowed for other kinds of things that may not have taken place. You know, we hired Dr. Molesse as a physical Ge uh, geographer, but he in fact is a hydrologist, and so is Dr. Suka. And of course, uh, Dr. Price within Earth Sciences also does a lot of uh, <coughs> um, hydrological type processes in her work. We also, the GIS Center was formed. They started a GIS certificate at the graduate level. We had people like Drs. McLean and, and Melissa who could teach GIS. Our sciences also had Dean Whitman, I think, taught that and some other people interested in those sorts of things. So <clears throat> when we merged, we also became the dominant player in the university in the GIS certificate. And um, the final thing I'll mention, because we're, I think, running out of time and people will probably have questions, is how we uh, 
what what would be the proper word? Finagled might be a good word. I'm actually not sure what that means. Somebody can look it up. Uh, wormed our way into a PhD program that works, okay, for everyone. It took a long time. And I should point out the uh, admirable work for several years, having been a person who, you know, developed several master's programs, the Master's of Environmental Studies, and now our professional master's and several certificate programs. I know the paperwork it has to go through to develop <laughs> these programs. And Lori Collins, who has just retired, worked her tail off for two years to figure out what we need to do to combine the various areas of expertise within Earth's Earth sciences, which includes atmospheric sciences now, that was the thing that we didn't mention, but around, around the turn of the century, they were talking about having an atmospheric program, which we do. We have some very good faculty in that area, as uh, some of you know, and a lot of expertise on hurricanes, which is quite handy down here. Um, and, uh, and you know, with that, with physical science, basically, with what we had in environmental studies, which is basically <clears throat> environmental resource conservation, kind of like a lot of applied ecology, like some of the work I've done, huge amounts of the work that uh, Jennifer Rehaj and Mike Ross and, and Hong Lu and people like that do. And then the whole social science component, which is my other half, which is these days about 80%, and also <clears throat> um, Dr. Bott and Dr. Gray and some other people. So we had this problem of trying to make one PhD program that kind of, uh, Fits all. I I'm not sure. Well, a lot, of, a lot of you are here. You can uh, have questions and answers. You can tell me how awful you think it is later. But um, you know, <laughs> but I think we're doing a fairly good job. And having been a graduate of Michigan School of Natural Resources, uh, I came through an interdisciplinary program. But in that case, it was mostly the uh, ecology, conservation, and then the social sciences that go along with that. In this case, we also have a whole other component with the uh, uh, earth and at atmospheric sciences. So, um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. And I, I really commend her for the amount of work she had to do uh, because it took uh, quite an intricate dance to get that kind of a interdisciplinary program approved. And a new PhD program has to go all the way to the top. It goes all the way to the Board of Regents. It has to be approved up and down in multiple stages. She um, did that. No wonder she retired. <laughs> Can't blame her. Anyway, um, those are the things I wanted to mention, kind of as an as an overview. And um, I think we were going to open it to just questions and answers. So yeah, you can address it to either one or both of us. I'll just sit. By yeah, you, you guys to... sit over there. And okay. so we have about fifteen minutes for questions. So I'm sure you have some questions. You know, uh, nice talk. Let's see. Okay. Anything I forgot, you guys can. Necessary. <laughs> uh, thank you both for giving such an overview of the history of the department, not just the facts, but also the evolution and the reflection on that. Uh, but in the room, there are a lot of students. You know, I was wondering if you could uh, make a comment on how the student demographics, you know, change over, over the years in terms of you know where they came from. Uh, the interdisciplinary nature of uh, the different things in a student do. You know, back in the days, it used to be mostly like Florida, South Florida, but now we have you know national and international community of students here and also discipline-wise. That's number one. Number two, where our students went in the past, what type of uh, areas our students got hired? Um, do you want to start? Our students, <clears throat> I can see on that way, we are extremely successful. Yes. I can take, for instance, I have graduated eight PhD students. They got jobs at Exxon, AP, Chevron, Aramco. Those are the biggest oil companies in the world. Big companies like Fugro. Gautam has now one of his students, a top scientist in India. We have another student, a top, uh, um, the top lab manager at Columbia University, Barnard. And of course, Winnie Price has her students now, one of the leaders in the water, water management district, not the water, the water and sewer here, you see. 
So we have all students in all good jobs, very, very successful. But in terms of the way they are coming from, the original students that we had, they were mostly international. On the contrary, now we are seeing more students from Florida coming. Actually, the last two students I graduated, they are from Florida. And so those are very good students who now have the opportunity to get their PhD program here. Yeah. So we see more and more people from Florida coming to us and less and less international. Of course, we have a few international, but we have more from Florida coming in. So for that, we can see that we've, we've done very, very well. Joel can comment on uh, our masters, how successful the masters program. Almost every semester we graduate six students, almost 18 students per year. Yeah. Our, our master's science and environmental studies was very, very successful. But then, of course, when the PhD happened and with the push to become higher in the rankings of Research One University, uh, university wide, the, the university pushed toward graduate funding to go toward PhDs. So that kind of had the effect of gutting our master's degree because we could no longer give master's students TAs and things like that. Uh, and so we still have quite a few, you know, part time master's students. But when we had that, uh, critical mass. It was really, you know, we were, we were graduating quite a few a year. I personally have um, been, you know, the major advisor for, I think, 35 master students so far that have finished. And they're all over the place. Environmental consulting firms, government jobs, because we didn't have our PhD in environmental studies and the, these people were before we had the joint PhD. Uh, the ones that did go out for PhD, which five of them, went to other universities, but I was on two of their committees at other universities too. And um, one of them is at, uh, I keep forgetting, where is Neil Lesh? Is it Clemson? Yeah, Clemson University, which is a pretty good one. Others are working for private consulting firms. And then of course, a big employment for <clears throat> anybody with a, a master's in this field or really earth sciences too, is um, agencies. So we have um, state and federal agencies all over, all over the country. <clears throat> Uh, another one who did go on for a PhD, who some of you do know, is Diana Tergazarian, and she is now the uh, GIS program director for uh, USC, the University of Southern California. She was here, and then she got this job, and she's Armenian. It turns out all of her relatives, like <laughs> most of the Armenian diaspora in the world, is in LA. So, so she really, they really wanted to move there. So, uh, so they really done, I would say, quite well, uh, um, and also. As far as the international component, I would say, <clears throat> obviously it's in the university uh, founding statements, and obviously it's it's in Miami because so many of the people who live here are of either you know were immigrated themselves or were of recent immigrant origin. But when we started hiring people who, like myself, much much of my own field work took takes place in Nepal and other places in Asia. So I've had, I think, uh, well, Sager's somewhere in the room. He's, he's my, my latest uh, student from Nepal. I think I've had six graduate students from Nepal uh, and several from other places like that. And of course we get a lot from the Caribbean. So I think um, the international, I don't, regardless of what the university's founding statements say, I think international happens when you hire f faculty who work internationally. And when you're in an area like Miami where we, we have such, Quotas. One thing I did not do until I got here was um, hang around marine areas very, very much. And so uh, I do that quite quite frequently now. Some of you know Stephanie Munguia, who's doing your dissertation work on the Ramsar near shore marine sites in, in the Caribbean. Um, I've also had a project with students quite a few places around Costa Rica, Panama, um, uh, Jamaica, not Haiti yet. So I'll have to do that. So, uh, so it's gotten me, you know, uh, much more looking at those kinds of things too. So I think that those things go hand in hand with being in Miami and hiring people from other places. You know, look how many African students we've had because of Asafa, for example. And now I have one applying too. So obviously, you both have seen a lot of evolution and development with this over time. Where do you see the department heading? Like if you have your ideal world before you both retire, what would you want to see? Well, I'm going to say something quickly and turn it over to him. <laughs> because this is something that um, has come up several times and he already kind of mentioned it, but 
where is geology anymore? And, you know, we, we've lost all these kind of traditional geologists and we've been able to hire all kinds of other positions. We've hired several more ecologists and we've hired, some, you know, a, a people here and there in, in other fields. Um, but, um, you know, and we had some great geologists, several of whom retired, like Dr. Kiki Vargas, now, um, now Lori, Lori Collins, and several uh, left along the way. And really at none of them, were replaced. So uh, that's something I think as a department we need to think about. Does this university want to have a geology program or does it not? <laughs> and um, at some point you got to... Yeah. Before the university was looking at programs and give adequate funding and faculty because you know you cannot say you have a program if you don't have the proper people to teach to, to the students. But now it seems to me that the focus is different. It's different. So I don't know. I cannot tell you. First of all, if I were chair of the department, my main focus would be to the politics, either here or out, to have a building for the department and have everybody together. Okay. And then to, to see what each program needs, just like we did it before. If you have an environment, you're in X, Y, Z, how many faculty you need in H, you see? The same way in geology, they said, because we had those, the consultant who came. Said, to have a, a proper discipline, you have to have at least three faculty in H. This is why we were building up. We'll have three hydrogeologists, two geophysicists, three, three sedimentologists, and three so on, so on. You know, this is the way because you have to have interaction. You cannot have just people randomly like that. And this is the way it is now. I mean, this is what I would fight for. I would make, I would, I would draw a proposal to show what is being done somewhere else. This is what we did. Because you know you cannot have program just randomly like that. You see what other people are doing, how successful they are, and we'll build something, and then I will push for the legislature. I will push toward the governor, like we did before. Because I didn't do all of those. I didn't tell you all of those things. We did all of those things all the way up to Tallahassee. You see, just in order to have a really because a lot of places they have environment and earth sciences. Each one of them is strong. You don't, you don't kill one for the other, okay? And this is exactly what is happening now. So this is why I can tell you what's going to happen. So me, if I were chair, this is what I would do. The same way that I told you that I built geology by going and propose to Medic exactly what we have to do. You see, in order to keep a department together to make it strong, this is the same thing I would do because we have excellent people here, you know? So I will show them how they could put, they could produce better if we are all together. There is interaction, and now there is no interaction. I'm sure even yourself, you're back there. You know, it's just scattered all over the place. This is not good. But I don't know because you know, I, as you see, I, I, that's my 50th year here. I don't know how, how long God will keep me on this earth. <laughs> I'm just fighting to keep alive. <laughs> But this would be my vision, okay, of what the department should be, like I see somewhere else. Because having things scattered all over, the model I saw here, because I came from a place where they had so many different disciplines, like Lamont of Columbia University, they had biology, they have geology and everything, but all of those are different divisions, but they were properly, uh, I would say, uh, staffed by the faculty and they interact, but they were all there, not just one, let's say downtown New York and the other one, you know, upstate New York and whatever, like um, which practically we have here, because you need the interaction. We don't have any more interaction. I don't know about you, because now I'm in PC just by myself, there is no more interaction. You don't see the students. No, this is not good. This is not good. I mean, that's one, that would be one of my main goals, just to do that, because we can do it. And we can justify it based on the number of students, 
based on number of FTEs, because you have to you have to play on your resources instead of just all, all little kind of you know silly little papers. You know, this is what I would do because it, we did it before. So um, <clears throat> I came out of the out of CERC and out of the institute, and nobody understood the kind of research units at that time. We, it developed out of drinking, drinking water. water yeah, yeah, that's how that really helped me a lot. But um, they they have the power now because they're they can bring a lot of money from from the state and and. If we can work through the through them together, we might be able to get a building with environmental. So that's the only way that's ever going to happen, I think. So can we come up with a vision for what we have, which has enriched my program a lot by being able to talk to geologists and meteorologists and so on. I've learned so much since I come here for, from that. Um, is there a, a vision given the kind of expertise as we have to not have a traditional geology and not a traditional policy and um, but something that's just all of what we have? No, like if I, the typical example would be Lamont, where I came from. Lamont has all of those things. And yet they have very good geologists, very good social scientists, all working, but in different areas. Okay. So yes, because you know, if you look at the problem of the earth, look at you have earthquakes in 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 in, uh, in Haiti, earthquakes in Puerto Rico, you have landslide, volcanoes, all kinds of things that this was the vision we had, you see. To have, because those things are permanent problems. You know, you have environmental problem, then you have geological problem, which are also part of environmental problems sometimes. So they can interact, but you still need those disciplines to be their own disciplines. Because you know, you have a petrologist is a petrologist. You know, it doesn't necessarily be an environmental petrologist, but the petrologist can interact with an environmental pe person to solve some problem for them, and so on. Just the same way I see at Lamont. I see they are still, they do, they work on glaciers, they work on, on, on hydrology, they work on all of those things that we are doing here, you see, but they are all together. Mm -hmm. They're all together so that they can interact, you know, not just individual. And the thing that I see is you have people doing research because they like doing research, they don't want to teach. So these people, they're on soft money. The way they did it at Lamont is they were on soft money, but because it's becoming more and more difficult to get money for research, so the, univers the, the university guarantees them three months per year. But those people, they do only research and they also, they bring big grant money. And then you have the faculty. You see the faculty doing research, they bring grant money, but they are not the one feeding the institute. You see the institute is being fed by those people doing just research because this is what they like to do. They interact, but they are two different entities. But this is that you can have this environmental center or the institute with people doing research. And like I told you, the drinking water center that we had was a very good model because that gave the faculty the time to do research, write grants, publish, and going back to the department. And then you have other people. And sometimes they, they could stay because as those things develop through time, they could stay half half. You see, they could stay half half and they do not have, but when they stay half half, they have to pay themselves. You see, but you could not take someone with the people's tax money to just do research and that person should be teaching students because this is what the university is for primarily. 
It's, yeah, it's a matter of allocating resources. Yeah, but the resource, if you look at the, the university is based on what? University is funded by the people's tax money to teach, to teach their, their people. Then research is another part because when we're developing, from what I knew, the university received money to for the faculty. And within that rank, there is like a 10% of research, but not only research, because your primary goal here is to do it. But you have people in centers that could do research, but they don't have to teach. And these kind of people, they have to pay themselves because this is a privilege to just do research because I mean, they are teaching, people don't think this is a big deal, but it is a big deal because you have to prepare, you have to take care, particularly if you have graduate students. So those are the two things, you know. I don't know, it seems to me now there is, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mess, the way I can see it, you know. <laughs> That's what I can do. question so much? Yeah. First of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Joyce Sart. And as Dr. Heinle mentioned, I got the first faculty in parameter faculty on the result designated as the professor of I was the first PhD student. Dr. Heinle was listed my director for this Although I was enrolled in the biology department of the PhD student, that was my we were smaller. Relationship with the environmental science, first year. I have the question uh, related to the, what the Professor Muresi has said about the soft money faculty and their involvement in the department. I am the soft money faculty for the last 20 years. <coughs> here after PhD, first as a postdoc, uh, visiting faculty, now as a PI, research associate professor, full-time soft money, no support from university. Now, I supervise some PhD student through my grant, but my involvement in the department as a major professor is not accepted. Even though, as Muresi said, the faculty's main job is to teach whether through the research or through the lecture. I want to teach the student, I'm teaching the student through the research by supervising the research. But my association with the department cannot be recognized as the major professor. Who, whose fault is this? Although University grant was the graduate student, graduate university graduate school had that policy until two years ago that the major professor has to be a tenure track in the department. But graduate school do not have that policy now. That is free, it is up to department. If the earth and environment department don't let the soft money position to be the major professor, how that Interaction can be materialized. That is my question. Any thoughts? I don't know. Again, I go back to Lamont. I will look at that. Some people, they do research, they do interact with the graduate students, but they are not the ones responsible for the graduate students. The people responsible are the faculty to give them the degree. So that's the way I see it. Because again, they pay themselves in the sense that they don't want to teach as such. They pay themselves by getting grants. And as I just said, because it's difficult sometimes to get some of the grant money, the university just support them because they do really do some great thing for the university by bringing all those grants, but they are not responsible for the graduates. The graduate students will always have a faculty. That means a tenured faculty. Is 
we do allow committee membership and co-chairs and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, they are part of the you know, so you, yeah. you can be yeah. part of it, but I, I understand the thing you can't really be the you know the, it, it's quite a bit different when you're a research yeah. the graduate committee's uh, yeah. discussion and they would it's not yeah, something, yeah, about the program. But it's presumably something we could make exceptions for, or maybe a rule we could change. Or at, at one point in time, you couldn't, it came from on high. I don't know what the situation is now. But these are all some growing pains. But overall, with both departments did well, like uh, by combining, we are really doing great. Yeah, and I, I think, think are... I don't think any uh, anyone can expect more than in terms of grants, in terms of uh, student support, in terms of FTEs, combinedly, combined unit. I think we are doing really, really great in everything. And, uh, so graduate students number increased dramatically, significantly, about masters and PhD students. I think uh, we, are, we are doing, we should be, we are the founders and then we should be very happy about it. Yeah. And two thirds of the, students in the introductory graduate classes are master's students somehow. I don't know how that happens, but. Well, we can ask students who are in the room because some of them are here, but I'm, I'm assuming that most of you are working and you're part-time students. Is that that's yeah. the case for the, a lot of our masters? Because we're really not supporting them like we used to. Facts, but like some people are. You gotta think we'll be best for like three of us at the very least. Yeah, yeah. People who get outside money are can put master's students on TAs, but um, are not TAs, RAs. But um, the funding is still much less, or at least it used to be. I don't know, like, how much are you paid per month? Oh my God, garbage. I'm <laughs> like $600. <laughs> yeah, see, the PhD students are, are annualized and they're paid at like twice the rate. And yeah. that, that's the. Allowed to work. So, like, somebody needs to fix that. Yeah. So, so it, is, you know, it just kind of makes the situation. We used to have at any given time, just in environmental studies before we merged, we would have about, well, you guys with directors around what, 40 to 50 full time graduate students, or, and then other part timers too, because some people were working. And that was enrolled simultaneously just in environmental studies, you know, when we were a small department. And that's no longer possible because of the, because uh, PhD students literally cost four times more, right? Because they're annualized and they're paid twice as much and it takes them twice as long to finish. So, you know. Doesn't that hurt the community in a way? Because like most of the PhD students you're going to get are not even taking from the floor or from this community. Whereas people who would do their master's and stuff tend to come from the community. So aren't you... Does well, I'm not sure that that's a concern for the for the for the bean counters because what they're looking at is we're a research one university and we want to grow in that rank, and the number of PhDs graduated is one of the masters don't matter. The number of PhDs graduated is one of the things, and even um, some of the big grad schools like Michigan, um, they have moved a lot of their resources to PhDs too, and they always had a lot of PhD students, but they have to pay them more now. Things have gotten more expensive. And so in the School of Natural Resources and Environment, which is where I graduated from, their master's program is almost completely professional masters now. And students pay that high, it's not a private school, but if you're out of state, it's essentially a private school uh, tuition and you know, you just deal with it. So it's not just here, it's happened in a lot of places too. And I guess um, having been born in the Pleistocene, I benefited from that because <laughs> I did two masters, had full funding, and then moved to Nepal for a while, then came back, then did a PhD, had full funding. No debt. It's, that's just getting rarer. And you're right, it's bad for the community, and it's it's you're gonna be a better PhD graduate if you have a master's degree first, and then you get a PhD for for 90% of people. I know most people wouldn't want to do, most people that I know from the undergraduate program wouldn't want to do a master's that's not funded. And then they're not so into research that they want to do a PhD. So it's just kind of like you're stuck there. Yeah, and that's that was also the rationale for them asking me, I mean, the dean basically told me to at the time to develop our professional master's program. 
but that never really took off like they proposed it would. And I didn't want to do it because I saw it competing with our already existing master's program, but um, they paid me so, and they told me to, and then they paid me. So I thought, okay, you know, this is boss. I can't say no. But, um, and that really has kind of cobbled along. I mean, it's still going, but it's, what did you say this year? It's nine or 10 students. Nine, nine students uh, this year. They, they, and that's when they take classes all day when, or Saturday, and they take Saturdays. an evening class. And, and it's all the same cohort of students that take the same classes for and a year and a half. Masters, the classes aren't, are they at I 95 or are they here? No, well? here in um, now we're going with hybrid model, uh, not uh, not every Saturday. One Saturday is online, other Saturday in class here in campus. Okay, that's I think we've had enough for today. Oh, a good, a good <laughs> session. <laughs> Yeah, but, Thank you. I'm glad you got all those pictures, by the way. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. I that you. I don't know. I can go a little I didn't hear We have a. Oh, yeah, let me say what it is. And it's <laughs> <laughs>